uh -huh. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We are down to 28, 30 people in the classroom. That's 10% of the students. How many people online? Can you check? 43. All right, that's 70 people. So that's then a third. I think I'll cancel class if there's nobody in the class for the next 10 minutes. Well, I had one miserable semester. We, we, we didn't, didn't have attendance requirements earlier. And then there was one miserable semester where we actually ran these stats and found that 70% of the students hadn't watched a single lecture. So there were people getting grades based on how they performed in their homeworks. Now, that's not what we want in this class or any class. So, uh, you know, you're paying $8,000 for the course. For every single lecture that you're coming here, coming here to, you're paying the, around $350 or $400. Now, if you're from China or India, that was your grandfather's annual salary. Every single class that you're blowing off, you're insulting your grandfather for one continuous year. Think about it, right? You should be very ashamed if you're blowing class off. Let's, let's start. Now, we're going to continue with convolutional neural networks. Just a quick recap what we've been through. Those of you at the back, everybody come front, because I don't need to yell. Can you just move ahead? Just come to the seats in front. We have room. You have your masks on. Make the rear of the class look empty. Just come ahead, right? OK. Now, here's a quick recap. Uh, we've uh, looked at, we've seen that pattern classification tasks, such as does this picture contain a cat, or does this recording contain the word hello? are best performed by scanning for the target pattern in the input data. And scanning an input with a network and combining the outcomes is equivalent to scanning with individual neurons hierarchically. We've also seen this, right? So the first level neurons scan the input. Higher level neurons, neurons scan the maps formed by the lower level neurons. And then a final decision unit or layer makes, makes the final decision. So deformations in the input can be handled by pulling. For 2D or higher dimensional scans, this structure is what we call the convolutional neural network, which we shorten it to ConNet. For 1D scan a long time, we called it a time delay neural network. It was on the slides. I didn't actually mention this in class. So here's the general architecture of the convolutional network. Again, you have convolutional layers, which might alternate with uh, down sampling, sampling layers. And eventually, it may be followed by one or more, uh, or by either a simple softmax or an MLP, basically some decision structure at the end. Now, so now over here, if you look at each of the layers, again, all of this is a quick recap. Those at the back, can you please come ahead? I want to pack the front of the class, so I don't need to yell. If students don't want to come to class, you may as well leave the classroom empty and save me the trouble of yelling. Okay. Now, here's the structure we saw. Uh, if you looked at the convolutional layers, the, each convolutional layer consisted of uh, several, several maps, produced several maps, which in your uh, uh, homeworks you probably uh, speak of as channels, right? Now, within each channel, there were two distinct operations going on. The first was a convolution by a filter, which produced an affine map. And subsequently, there was an activation applied to each point on the affine map to produce the output. So this co computation of an affine map, this is performed using a learnable filter. This is what it looked like. You would have, if you were producing a certain number of output maps or channels in your terminology, every one of these output maps considered every one of the maps or the channels from the previous layer. And then you have a collection of filters each filter has a number of planes or channels, again, if you'd like to think of it that way, one per input channel, right? And so the first filter convolved with the entire collection of input maps to produce the first output map. And so you get one output map per filter. Yeah, was there a hand raised? Okay. Now, the number of weights to, uh, that you had, number of parameters that you had in each filter, 
was equal to the size of the individual planes of the filter times the number of input maps. And the operation, of course, we saw was like so. In order to compute the affine maps at, at any layer, uh, okay, in order to compute an affine map at any layer, we place the corresponding filter. Guys at the back, can you come to the front? There's space out front. I want to leave the back empty. I don't want to yell. Okay. You place the filter on the input map. So you'd have one plane of the filter on each input map. And then you perform a component-wise product of the filter value shown by the color and the underlying map itself. So this is the filter at each location times the underlying map. You summed over this entire region and across all maps. And then if you had a bias, remember again that your filter is just a neuron, so it also has a bias. You added that in, and so that gave you the affine value at one location. So to compute the entire map, you scanned the input set of input maps using the filter in this, in this manner till you got all the way to the end, and you got one entire map, right? So the key point here was that in order to compute any map, in order, in order to compute any location of any affine map uh, in the convolution operation, you considered all of the maps in the input, which are, which are the maps from the previous layer. So those are the ones shown in yellow, right? Now, once the uh, affine map was com computed, you had to compute, you had to apply activations to the affine map to compute the output. And so this was applied pointwise. To each location in the Z map, you applied some activation, your activation of choice, and you got the corresponding location from the output Y map. So this is the sequence of operations that we saw. So here's the more explicit uh, illustration. You get all of the input maps are convolving with all of the planes of the corresponding filter in order to compute one output affine map. And then you have a pointwise activation that operates on this affine map to compute the final output map or the output channel uh, in each layer. So again, nothing new. This is what we've seen in the last class, right? Here is the, uh, some pseudocode for it. Again, remember, this is the scanning version of the operation. So you go through the layers. Within each layer, you're scanning the input. And then within, when you're scanning, you're computing each of the channels, each of the maps. And for each map, you're slicing out a segment from all of the maps in the previous layer compute and computing an affine function of it, where the weights are your filter. And then finally, you apply an activation to it. right? And if you were doing this with strides, the same operation applies. You're going to be you're going through the layers, but then within the layers, you'd be striding across x, striding across y, and then pulling out a slice, a square slice from all the maps, and then computing an affine value and applying an activation to it. So the reason we're actually going through this is we'll see uh, how you thinking of things in this manner actually helps you compute, perform back propagation. Right? So here's your first poll. Okay, you have 10 seconds, folks. <laughs> All right. So the poll remains up for 10 more seconds, but uh, I'm moving on, right? And I'm going to skip the, actually, I'll give you the answers because you don't get scored for these polls. Now, the number of planes, when I speak of planes, this is you're really speaking of channels in your terminology, right? in any filter equals the number of input maps or input planes, right? So because the filter has one channel per input channel. And 
uh, the number of filters equals the number of output channels or output maps. You're going to get one filter per output map. The other two statements are clearly not true. Now, what about these downsampling layers? Here's what these downsampling layers were in the convolutional filter. The downsampling layers were performed through pooling. Pooling was performed by a pooling filter, which would look at a small region of the input, and if you were performing max pooling, it was going to pick the largest value in the input and copy it out. And the pooling filter would stride forward, and typically the stride of the pooling filter, especially when you're performing pooling, because pooling is an operation that's trying to account for jitter. It's trying to account for distortion. So when you've, account, when you've already considered some region of the input, you probably don't want to consider it a second time. And so pooling typically strides forward by more than one. And so as a result, the output of the pooling tend, will generally be smaller than the input by a proportionality factor, where the proportionality factor is, a stri is the stride. And so this is what we will call downsampling. If you think of it this way, you're sort of sampling down and reducing the size of the input by, a step, by, a, uh, by some fixed fraction, right? So the thing about pooling over here, unlike your convolution, when, you, when we were performing the convolution operation, every one of these maps considered every one of the input maps. In the case of pooling, it's different. In the case of pooling, each map considers only the corresponding map from the previous layer. So when you have a pooling layer, the, uh, in order to compute the output channel for any particular, uh, for any particular output channel, you're only considering the corresponding input channel you're not considering the rest of the channels, right? Now, so here's what the pooling would look like if you were to write pseudocode for it. Within any layer, you're going through all the channels. So this is within one layer, right? You're just considering all of the channels. And then within the channel, you're, as you stride forward, you're pick, pick, picking a small square region of the input. And then just picking, finding the index of the largest value of the input. Again, we mentioned in the last class that you go, you first pull out the index and then you copy the value over. So you find the index and then you copy the value at that index location into the output. Right? Now, you don't necessarily have to perform max pooling. You could be performing other kinds of pooling operations. Again, pooling had to do with uh, introducing distortion invariance, or try making things robust to distortion or jitter. So instead of finding the maximum value, you could find the mean, in which case you'd find the mean of all of these four values, right? And scan. So the only thing that changed in the uh, code is whereas when you were performing max pooling, you had two steps. The first step was that you found the index of the maximum and then copied the value over. If you're performing mean pooling or any variant of mean pooling, we saw many different variants in the last class, you could be finding the PNOM. Then you'd just be finding the mean of that little region. In all cases, the pooling operations, each pooling channel has com computed using, based only on the corresponding channel in the input, right? And so running to the end of our recap, having spent 20 minutes on it, the uh, Here's how the end-to-end uh, -end CNN worked. You had some input, maybe a color image, which is multiple channels. You stack them up, and then you had a sequence of convolutional layers followed by, optionally followed by, downsampling layers. You don't necessarily have to have one downsampling layer for every convolution layer, but this is the general sequence of operations that you had, and each convolution layer had corresponding to it a bunch of filters, one filter per channel, right, per output channel, output map. And now when you want to compute, when you want to learn the model, here are all the things that you would have to learn. You have a sequence of convolutions and downsamplings, and when you're finally done with convolutions and downsampling, you're going to have a collection of maps which will each have some, num some, some values in it, numbers. You finally have a decision structure, which could just be a simple softmax 
or if you want to get or a max, or if you want to get fancy, you throw in an entire MLP over there. So you read all of these values, pass them through an MLP, and you get your output. So now the parameters that you have to learn are the parameters of this final decision MLP, and also the parameters of all of the filters, all the convolutional filters, right? And now how would you do this? Remember that in spite of this very complicated looking operation, this is just scanning with an MLP, right? And when you scanned with an MLP, the entire scanned, scanning MLP turned out to be just one giant MLP with shared parameters. So that tells you that the training is going to be exactly the same as what you would have when you did your standard MLP. So if you didn't attend the rest of today's lecture and if you just went home and decided to skip the polls, all that you would lose is efficiency in your code. The rest of it is good. It could still be done so long as you realize that this was just scanning with an MLP, right? So I'm literally going to be spending the next 70 minutes teaching you how to do the whole thing efficiently. Now, so training is going to be just as in the case of a regular MLP. You have training examples, image class pairs. You're going to define a loss, which is the divergence between the actual and desired output for the network. And then you're going to train the network parameters to minimize this loss using gradient descent. So here's what you'd have. If you had some input, you pass the input through the network, you get some output here. If you're performing multi-class classification, you're going to have as many outputs as classes. You have your desired output. You say, this is actually a house. This is not a cat, right? And so you compare a computer divergence between the true and the true and actual outputs. That's going to give you the divergence. And if you have to perform, to, to train the network, you wouldn't just train on one sample. You're going to have a collection of training samples. So many samples where you have the input and the corresponding desired output. For each one of these outputs, you can compute, you can, you can uh, compute the divergence, the loss between the actual and target outputs. So the overall loss is the average of the divergences for the individual instances. And since we are performing gradient descent, what we want to do is to compute the derivative of this loss with respect to every single filter parameter so that we can apply this in gradient descent. And the derivative of the loss, of course, with respect to the parameter is, of course, the average of the derivatives of the divergences for the individual instances. And so this is the term that we really want to compute in order to be able to perform backpropagation, right? So given this, going back to a single instance, We've already seen in previous classes how you can perform backpropagation for an MLP. So for an, ML, an, an MLP, if I have an actual output for the network and a desired output for the network, then I can compute the divergence. I can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to every one of the parameters of the MLP, but I can also compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the input to the MLP itself, right? And now here's where Things get, I mean, there's not particularly uh, complicated. Uh, when you have a CNN, you have several CNN and downsampling, convolutional and, uh, convolutional and downsampling layers. And then when you're done with all of the convolution and downsampling layers, you're going to get a number of maps as we have over here in the end. Now, if you look at all of these maps, what really happens is these maps have values over here. And for the final MLP, you're just taking all of these values and writing down, uh, sort of flattening them down into a vertical structure and passing it through the MLP to get your output Y, which you can compute the divergence for, given the desired, desired output D, right? So when you compute your de de perform back compute your derivatives going backwards, you're going to have the derivatives for each one. I mean, since you can also compute the derivatives for the input of the MLP, you're going to have the derivatives for each one of these guys. Divergence over, say, dx1, right? But that derivative is the same as the derivative with respect to this element here in the maps. So basically what this means is that 
you can take this collection of derivatives and fold them back into the map shapes, the, into the shape of the final output channels of the network. And once you do that, going backwards through the MLP means that you have the derivatives with respect to the final output of the network. And now you have so, and now you have to pass those derivatives backwards. And when you're passing those derivatives backwards, this is where the convolutional and shared computation structure kicks in. And so you need to make adjustments. And how those derivatives are passed backwards, only for the purpose of efficiency. Again, if you just thought of this as one giant MLP with shared parameters, you could still write code for it. It's just going to be really bad, right? So now, let's see what changes we want to make over here. So first, there are two distinct kinds of operations over here. First, of course, is you have convolutions and then you have downsampling, right? So in, the, in a convolution layer, what happens? In a convolution layer, you have a bunch of input channels. So I'm speaking of the Lth convolution layer, Lth layer. So you have the, uh, the input channels to the Lth layer, the output channels of the L minus 1th layer, right? And so these, all of these channels are combined or convolved with a filter, where the filter has as many planes or channels as the number of input channels to produce one output affine channel. And then that affine, uh, that affine map is going to be operated on by an activation to get the output map. Now, when I'm computing my derivatives backward, I'm assuming that I already have a derivative, the derivatives with respect to the final entries in the final, final maps, right? So I can assume that at least for the final layer, I have the derivative of the loss with respect to every element of y going backwards. And so now from here, what I need to do is to go for, and these, these y's are what we call the activation maps, remember? So now what we have to do is to figure out how to go from the activation maps backwards to compute the derivatives for the affine maps then how to go from the derivatives of the affine maps backwards to compute the derivatives for the input maps, but also for the filters in the process. Now, for the pooling layer, you don't have this complex structure. For the pooling layer, each output map depends only on one input channel. So here, once again, you can assume that you have the derivatives with respect to all of these y's you have to figure out how you take a step back and compute the derivatives with respect to the input channels. So everybody clear with all of this so far? There's nothing particularly complicated, right? So here's what we need to summarize. We assume that we already have the derivatives with respect to the output activation maps for any layer. And then you want to pass the derivatives backwards. There are two kinds of layers when you're going back. For convolution layers, we want to figure out how to compute the derivatives with respect to, first, with respect to the affine maps, the affine combination Z, and then use those derivatives to go further back and compute the derivatives for the filters and the derivatives for the input maps. In the case of the pooling layers, you're given the derivatives with respect to YL, which is the output of the pooling. You need to compute the derivatives with respect to YL minus 1. Right? Is everybody clear so far? Raise your hands if you are. Okay. I think some of you are looking very bored already. It gets worse. Okay. Now let's start. Let's start with these guys, step by step. How do we deal with convolution layers? Now within convolution layers, again, there are two different operations, right? First is computing the affine map, and then computing the activation map. So going backwards from the derivatives for the entries of the activation map, you need to compute the derivatives for the affine maps. So this is easy. This is very, very easy. Remember how we did this. When we were applying the activations, you had the affine map. And the affine map had a bunch of values. And then you applied your activation to it. And you got your activation maps. So these were the y's. These were the z's. And each element over here gave you the value for the corresponding element in the y. 
So when you're going backwards, if, I want to, if you want to compute the derivative of, and this, of course, influences the loss, right? If you want the derivative of the loss with respect to a particular element in z, all you need to do is to do dl over d y i j k, you know, this particular element times I'm using three uh, indices, you know, the layer, the, the channel, and the two-dimensional position in this case, right? So it's going to be component by component. You literally just apply the derivatives. Uh, the chain rule up going back component by component again. So the output at any position is basically computed only by applying the activation to the affine value at that position. So going backwards, if you want the derivative with respect to any element in z, it's going to be the derivative in any element in y times the derivative of the activation function at that z location. So this is, again, nothing complicated. This is the easy bit, right? So this is done. The first thing is done. That was really easy. Let's look at something a little more complex now. How do you compute the derivative with respect to the output maps to the, to the uh, uh, input channels and the derivatives with respect to the filters given the derivatives with respect to the z. Now this ends up looking a little more complex than the earlier one simply because you have all of these. If, because you have uh, a fairly complicated operation where you have a collection of maps influencing every single output map. So let's see how this works. It turns out this, you know, although it looks complicated, operations-wise, mathematics or arithmetic-wise, it's trivially easy. And let's work it out. Now, in the affine computation, when you're going forward, the first thing you do is that you compute the affine map. So here you have four indices, L, N, X, Y. Let me explain the indices. L is the layer. N is the channel or the, number, the index of the map. X, Y is the position. I'm assuming these are two-dimensional data, right? So Z, L, N, X, Y is going to be computed from Y, L minus 1, so all the channels from the previous layer, right? And with the filters, the filters, the L layer filters. Now, the filters are going to be very specific. The filter has many, to compute the mth output channel, you need the, the, the Lth the nth output channel, you need the nth filter. And the nth filter is going to have as many channels itself as the number of input channels, right? So that's why you have m, n, and the filters are two-dimensional, x, y. So our problem is given, now we've assumed that already that we know how, we, we've got the derivatives with respect to the z's, right? So our problem is given the derivative with respect to every element of the uh, affine map, how do you go back and compute the derivatives with respect to every element of the input maps? And how do we compute the derivatives with respect to every element of the filters? Let's look at this guy first. How do we compute the derivatives with respect to every element of the input maps? Now, here is the operation again. We assume that we have managed to work our derivatives all the way until here, right? And we want to compute the derivative with respect to these guys. Now, let's consider how a single map z over here, right? A single, single output channel. Any single output channel is obtained from all of the input channels. That's how the computation is performed. And so the nth output channel used the nth filter and the nth filter in turn had as many planes or as many channels as there were input channels, right? So during the forward operation, each input channel convolved with the corresponding channel of the filter. And all of these convolutions were summed to compute the output channel. So this is the influence diagram. Every one of these maps influences this map. And the manner in which any particular map influences this map is through the corresponding plane, the corresponding channel of the corresponding filter, right? So let me just sort of simplify the picture over here. You have 
the, uh, let me call this the mth input channel, influences the nth activation map, the input nth output channel, through the m nth filter plane. So this is the mth channel of the nth filter. Is this clear? I mean, there's a lot of terminology over here, indices, but is this whole thing clear to you guys, right? Raise your hands if it is. Thank you. So now, if I go back and look at this, every one of these channels is influencing every one of these. Every one of these input channels is influencing every one of these output channels. What we saw here was that any given input cha output channel was influenced through all the input channels, right? And but in particular, the mth input channel influenced the nth output channel through the mnth filter plane, right? So this is the complete set of influences. But then if I'm looking, considering the derivative of one particular input elements of one particular input channel, let's focus on this guy, right? Here are all the influences that you have got. So this input channel influences all of the output channels, and all of them in turn influence the divergence, right? And so the mth input channel over here influences the first output channel through WM1. It influences the second one through WM2, and so on. So you're looking at one plane from a different, each of them comes from a different filter. This one influences the first output channel through the mth plane of the first filter. It influences the second channel through the second mth plane of the second filter. This is kind of important, right? I mean, it's not complicated, but you've got to keep track of this. And now, when I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this guy, I obviously have to sum over all of these terms because this input ch channel is influencing all of the uh, channels in the next layer, and all of them have something to do with the derivative, to, to, with their final divergence, right? So if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this guy, I had to sum over all of these. And then using the chain rule, it's the derivative of the divergence with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to y. Right. Now, if you just want to write out the math in this manner, things get a little ugly. Because this is a two-dimensional map. This, too, is a two-dimensional map. right? So the derivative of a two-dimensional structure with respect to a two-dimensional structure is a four-dimensional structure. And uh, just writing out in pure algebraic terms can get ugly. So what we will do instead is to look at individual elements to see how the chain rule works out for individual elements. I could have just used this directly, and you know things would work, except that it's going to be very, at least in my head, it, it gets painful. So let's look at, first, how does a particular input channel influence a specific output channel? So over here, we are going to see how to compute this term, the derivative of a, you know, again, to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this guy, you're summing over all of these. And what you're summing is the derivative of the divergence with respect to z times the derivative of the z with respect to y. So let's look at one specific z. What is the derivative of z with respect to y? Now, to understand this, let's go back and again look at it from a per element basis, on a, on a per element basis. Now, consider this is the same picture you saw in the last class. So this green picture over here represents one of the input channels. And consider, say, this, this first this uh, element shown in uh, that, I've, that I've marked in red. And the filter, of course, is shown by these little numbers at the bottom right. And let's take a look at which of the output, ma output map elements this input element influences. And as you go through the arithmetic, as you go through the convolution, you can see that this element clearly influences the computation of the top left element in Z. That's because the filter sits on top of the element, right? So if you work out the, if you go through the animation, if I can do this, you can see that when you look at 
all the when you when you consider how many of the output elements are influenced by this one guy in red, you saw that it actually influenced several output elements. In fact, it influenced all of those guys, right? So if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this term, I have to consider all of these linkages, all of these four elements. But then, remember that this element didn't just influence one output map, it influenced all of the output maps, right? The operation is symmetric, which meant that this element influenced these four components in every one of the output maps, right? And so if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this one guy, I have to compute, I have to sum over all of these arrows going out. Now, in this particular case, there are only four arrows going out. In the general case, you can make no such assumption. You're going to assume that every element of the input map influences every element of every channel of the output map. Is that making sense? Right? And so, if I were to write the arithmetic likes, the derivative of the divergence with respect to any particular element of an input map is going to be the summing over all of the output maps. And within, over, in, in all of the output maps, it's going to be summing over all of the positions in the map. And within each position in the map, it's going to be the uh, summing the product of the divergence, derivative of the divergence with respect to the corresponding z times the derivative of that z itself with respect to y, x, y. Is this clear to everybody where this came from? Pardon me? This is the more generic case. Gen generic case over here. for this particular game. Okay, you tell me this. What is the derivative of this guy with, re with respect to this element? Zero. So that's so this subsumes it, right? Oh. Does it not? So this is the most generic case. We are not making any assumptions about the size of the filter, where it's placed, nothing at all, right? Okay, so this first term, we assume has already been computed when you are going backwards, right? Because that's what we just did. So the real question is, what is the derivative of the z element with respect to this particular x, y element of the input map, right? So to see this, let's go back and look at the operations again. I'm going to do today's lecture entirely with visuals, but you should be able to go back and write out the math, okay? Specifically, let me consider the two twoth element of the of some input channel in the L minus one layer, okay? And so of the mth input channel. And I want to see how it influences different elements of the nth output channel. And the, and the corresponding plane of the nth filter is shown by this colored picture over here. So clearly the filter uh, span is three cross three. I'm using two different ways of indexing the elements in the filter. Can you see how, what, what the two different ways are? Can, can anybody see it? Maxwell? Guys, come on, it's staring you in the eye. What are the two ways in which I'm indexing those things? Pardon me? Coordinates and colors. So we're going to need both for the visuals, okay? So over here, the zero, zero coordinate is pink. Thank you, right? It's staring you in the eye, in, in the face. You should be able to answer these trivial questions. Now, when I try to compute the zth value in the zero, zeroth corner, right? I'm indexing, I'm using zero-based indexing. What do I do? I place this filter, again, there are many such channels. I'm looking at only one input channel, right? I place this filter starting at zero, zero. And what is the contribution of two, two to zero, zero? There are many other terms. You're summing over the entire filter, right? But the two, two in particular is contributing y two, two times filter two, two. Everybody see how that's happening? Can you see the relationship between the indices on the left and the right? Anyone want to hazard what that relationship is? 
Maybe I'll pick a name, Meghna. It's, I put it on the slides to help you guys, is this all right? So 0, 0 plus 2, 2 is 2, 2, right? OK. OK, thank you. So I've just moved it a bit, right? Now if I want to compute the one zeroth element, I'm going to place the filter at one zero, starting at one zero, right? What is the contribution of two two to one zero? It's going to be y two two times the pink element over here, w one two, right? Once again, look at the indices. This is one zero, one zero plus one two gives you two two. You see how that happens, right? If you're still not convinced, let me move one step forward. So I want to compute the 2 0 element of z. I place the filter starting at 2 0. And then once again, the contribution of 2 2, 2 2 is going to be multiplying this green element whose index is 0 2, right? And so z 2 0 has a contribution y 2 2 times w 0 2. And once again, you can see 2 0 plus 0 2 equals 2 2, right? And maybe you're still not convinced. This is special. To, this is specific to the top row. So I'm going to move one row down. Look at this guy. You know the zero one element. I place this filter here. So I'm multiplying two two by this green one, which is w two one. So z zero one is y two two times w two one. And once again, you can see how zero one plus two one equals two two. Yeah. Please bear with me. That's a good question, right? OK, so as I keep going forward, you will find that this relationship always holds. The index of the, the uh, output channel, position of the output channel, and the index of the filter sum up to give you the index of the y element that is being considered in every single case. So I can write this generically. So you know we have went through all of the examples. So I can write it generically for this two two element as you know z x prime y prime is going to be y two two. You know the contribution of y two two is going to be y two two times w of x prime minus two y prime minus two, right? Because these two guys sum up to give you two two. Yes. So the point is this, right? Eventually, uh, if you consider the contribution of this is a, this is a straight up convolution, right? Uh -huh. So if I'm looking at say this guy here, the one two, yeah. you're placing the filter on one two. That's about it. There's no other. That that is the basic mechanism of the computation, right? Uh -huh. So when I do that, which element of the filter is two two multiplying? It's going to be multiplying this brown element over here, which is one zero. Oh, yeah. okay. Right? That's about it. That's the only way that that's the way the operation is being performed. There's no permutation going on over here. Every single element is being considered. I'm focusing on one particular input element. Oh, I see. Okay. Right? This is that's why this is a plus equals, right? I'm not I'm ignoring the rest of it. So I can write this generally, right? z x prime y prime, any particular x prime y prime location over here, the contribution of any x y in y is going to be y x y times w x minus x prime y minus y prime. Everybody clear with me, right? OK. So what is the derivative of z with respect to z x prime y prime with respect to y x y? What? It's just a w, right? We'll, that's a good question. If I haven't addressed it by the end of the lecture, ask me again. Right? So this is the relationship that we got. 
So I can go back to my original equation. When I say what is the derivative of the divergence with respect to any particular y x y, I'm summing over all of the filters, all of the output channels. Within all of the output channels, I'm summing over the entire area of the channel. And within each position, I'm computing the product of the derivative with respect to the corresponding z times the derivative of that z with respect to y x y, right? And we just figured that this term over here, the derivative of z x prime y prime with respect to y x y was just w x minus x prime y minus y prime, right? So the math is clear. There's nothing particularly complicated about this math. Two poles. The poles not showing up, or they're showing up. I don't know. I'll get through all of today's. Okay, guys. Ten seconds for people in the class. Yes. So what, so, okay, tell me, what is W, w minus 1? Hmm. If x minus x prime becomes negative, what is W minus, you know, what is the W at a negative value? Because the filter is limited, it's like saying it's 0 everywhere outside. So you're padding. Yeah, no, so it's 0, basically. There's no, no, no need to even pad. When the indices go out of bounds, it's implicit, the filter is implicitly 0, right? Okay. Hmm. So... In order to compute the derivative at, every, at a single affine element, we must consider the contribution of every position of every affine map at the next layer. This is true, right? So also, the derivative of a single affine element will require summing over every position of every z map in the next layer, also true. Now, we're basically, they both do the same question twice. Yeah. So when I'm speaking of the plane, I'm speaking of a channel. So I'm using the term map or plane. Basically, if I look at this figure over here, each of these is, if I go back here, I have said this, maybe I wasn't clear enough. I have to go back, so way back. Actually, I, I don't need to go back. I can go ahead. Uh, give me a second. This is the problem with animation. There's too much. We'll get to this figure. This is annoying. How far do I have to go? This is, don't ask me painful questions. Now, here. Yeah. We had this filter here, right? The filter has one channel corresponding to every input channel, so I'm just calling it a plane. This is the mth plane of the filter, as far as I'm concerned. So, that, so the number of channels. So the planes are the channels, right? OK, so now let's go back here. and. My good God. <laughs> I need better animation than this. And this is, this is the problem. OK. So we gave you, I gave you a fairly ugly equation. And I said this equation holds. And you have reason to trust the equation because we sort of convinced ourselves that this is how things are computed. The derivative of the divergence with respect to any y, x, y is going to be the sum over all of the channels or the maps or the planes, depending on what you, how, you know, the, I, I keep using different terms. And over all the positions in each of the output maps of the product of the derivative with rest for the out, you know, corresponding location in the map times the filter value that connects the two, right? This guy is actually a con convolution. So although it looks really ugly, it just turns out to be a convolution, and it turns out to be a really simple convolution. Let's see how, right? Now let's consider the 2-2 two, two guy again, and let's see how 2-2 two, two influences different locations in the Z map, okay? So if you look at 2-2, two, two, to compute Z0,0, zero, zero, I used the 
2-2 position of the filter, right? Because I placed the filter at 0, 0, and the 2, 2 position of the filter ended up on 2, 2. That's the color red. So I placed the color red over here. That's the red location in the filter, right? Now, when I want to compute Z10, I place the filter starting at 1, 0. Which location of the filter was used? It was the 1, 2, right? That's the color pink. So I put the color pink over here. Everybody seeing what's happening with the colors, right? When I want to compute 2, 0, I place the filter at starting 2, 0. The location of the filter that was used was the 0, 2 guy, right? So I place that color out here. When I want to compute Z, 0, 1, I place the filter starting at 0, 1. The location of the filter that was used was this 2, 1 thing, right? This color. So I placed it out here. And going forward, I'm putting all the colors at each location. And now when you compute the derivative for Z2, Y22, which is the derivative for this guy, what were you really doing? You were, comp you were multiplying the filter location here with the derivative for the Z map at the same location, correct? And then adding it. So if you look at this guy, you are basically summing over this entire thing. At each position, you are multiplying the derivative for the underlying z by the corresponding filter value. So if you look at the whole structure, what does this arrangement of colors, how does that relate to this one? Flipped both ways, left, right, and top, bottom, right? And so basically, what does this mean? You're basically placing for any particular location now. So you're flipping the filter, but then observe something. You want the derivative for 2, 2, correct? So you're flipping the filter left, right, top, bottom, and then you're placing the bottom right corner of the flipped filter, which corresponds to the 0, 0 location over here, at 2, 2, right? And then, and then performing the inner product. Is that, make, is that clear to everybody? Raise your hands if it is, right? Yeah. Was there a question? Yeah, I have. Um, I don't understand. Like, I'm pretty sure that. So take a look. Do you, did, you, do you, did you understand this arrangement of colors over here? Yeah. OK. Do you, did you agree that when I'm computing the derivative for y22, at each location, I'm multiplying the filter value over there with the derivative for z at that location, and then summing over that region? Right? That's basically what we're doing over here at each, po at each position, right? So in order to compute the derivative for y22, what did I do? I flipped the filter and placed, if you just visually see this, the 0, 0 location is now placed at 2, 2. And then I'm just computing an inner product between the flipped filter and the derivative map underneath. Right? for the 2, 2 element only, right, at this point. But I can generalize this, right? If I want the computation for any x, y element, the same logic applies. I'm going to flip the filter top left, right, top, bottom. I'm going to place the 0, 0 element at x, y. And then I'm going to go over the region, and I'm going to be performing a component-wise product of the flipped filter and the underlying and the derivative for the underlying z, and then summing up. So the derivative with respect to y, x, y is going to be the sum over all of these elements of the derivative of the, for the corresponding z and the y that sat on top of it when you're, when you're computing the corresponding z, right? So the way, the way that sat on top of it. So that's what this equation really means. Now, so let's actually see how this works out, right? Equations don't make a lot of sense. Pictures do. So I've got a filter here. And this filter, I'm, I'm again, I'm considering only one input channel at this point, right? So the manner in which this filter worked with this input channel to compute this output channel, right, was as follows. We sat this filter here at the top left corner and computed the top right corner of the channel, right? 
Now going backwards, if I have the derivatives of the divergence with respect to each one of these elements, I am trying to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each one of these elements, okay? So how do I compute the derivative for this one guy? Mechanically, here's what I do. I'm going to be zero padding. Remember, when I, when I was convolving forward, the map reduced in size, right? So to account for it, I'm going to be zero padding. If my filters are k cross k, I'm going to be zero padding this whole thing with k minus one rows and k minus one columns, okay? On every side, not symmetrically, on every side, okay? And now to compute the derivative for zero, zero, first I'm going to flip this filter, left, right, top, bottom. I'm going to sit that filter with the zero, zero element at the position for which I'm going to compute the derivative and I perform an inner product of the underlying derivative map and the flipped filter, right? Yes. So you're convolving the flipped filter with, with the derivatives. The map of the derivatives of z, correct. And reverse the pattern. Yes, right? And now I can just go forward and compute this for every single location. Very straightforward, right? So once you see this, the equation doesn't become, the equation looks a lot more complex than the actual operation itself. Where do you stop? You stop when you run out of z, right? So if I'm stopping at when I run out of z, what is the size of the map that I'm actually computing? So here's what I get. If my z map is like so, I've padded all around, I stop at this location, but then that is really this index, right? So the size of the convolution that you get is going to be this guy. Is that making sense to you, right? And that means the, the convolution is going to have k minus one more rows and k minus one more columns than what went in. Because you have k minus one on every side. Right? So, but then we saw that the input channel influences every output channel, right? So this is only giving you the contribution of one output channel. What we want to do is to, con to consider every output channel for any particular filter. So uh, this, this entire collection is maybe convolving with this entire filter to give you this guy, right? So, I took, no, wait. This entire collection is convolving with this entire guy to give you this one guy. It's, it's convolving with this entire filter to give you the last guy, right? So now, if I want to compute the derivative for the mth input channel, the mth input channel has influenced every one of these guys through the mth channels of the filters, correct? So I have to consider this collection of channels from all the filters. Is that making sense, guys? Raise your hands if it is, right? And so here's what I will do. Um, these are the, these guys here are these channels. These are the mth channels of all of the filters. These are the derivative maps for all of the output maps, right? And I'm comp trying to compute the derivatives for all the entries in the mth input channel. First thing I will do, I'm gonna be flipping all of these guys, left, right, top, bottom, okay? I'm going to be zero padding all of these guys. Then I put this entire collection here and convolve. And that gives me the entire set of derivatives for the entire input channel. Is this operation clear to everybody, right? This has got to be much clearer than the math itself, what we are doing, and the why, right? So here's the actual operation that happens if I were performing, performing the convolution for the entire set, do you know? So this is for one, the derivative is for one input channel. You're going to have to repeat this for every one of the input channels to get the entire set of derivatives. Questions? Yeah, so this is the derivative for 
the affine maps going backwards, right? And then you're going to pad it with k size after y. No, you're padding it with k. If you have the filter sizes k cross k, then you're adding k minus one rows and k minus one columns on every side. of the filter, right? Otherwise, you cannot fit it, okay? This has got to be clear to everybody. So just to answer your question, right? What is the size of the Y map? Remember what happened when we were going forward. When we were going forward, if I had an, had an M cross M input and I had a k cross k filter, the size of the output was m minus k plus 1, right? Times m minus k plus 1. So this is going to be smaller than this one. So when you're going backwards, you have to recover the size clearly, right? And so that's basically what is going to happen. So if I call this, say, l cross l, then this going backward is going to be l plus k minus 1 going backwards. So it's, you're basically recovering the a number of rows and columns that you lost going forward when you go backward. And so we, we perform some strange operations going forward. Sometimes we zero padded. Sometimes we took, took bigger strides, right? If I perform zero padding going forward, then effectively when I perform the forward convolution, I was convolving the zero padded map, right? So when I go backwards, I'm going to get derivatives for the zero padded map. And what I want to re retain is just the derivatives, de derivatives in the inner region and throw the rest away. Is that clear to everybody? Right, so what happens if you have a stride greater than one? When you have a stride greater than one, having a stride greater than one is the exact same operation as having a stride of one and throwing away elements, right? So if you had a stride of two, this is exactly the same as performing a forward convolution with a stride of one and throwing away every second element. That clear to everybody, right? So when I go backwards, this is all I retained because I threw away every sec second element, right? When I'm coming backwards, I'm going to get the derivatives for these guys. And so I can copy those into the locations from where they were copied. Now, does perturbing this element change the output? No. So what would the derivative there be? Zero. I just fill in zeros. And then I can perform my convolution going backwards. So this is to answer your question on strides. Right? Is this clear to everybody? Right? The whole thing is very simple. There's nothing fancy. <laughs> you know, if you, are, you get your derivatives here, maybe you pad them out with zeros if you have a down sample going back forward, and then compute your convolutions going back. Um, why must we remove the zero padding regions in the y derivative? Pardon me? Why do we have to remove the zero padding regions in the y derivative map? Won't they automatically be taken more? That's the, they're effectively being converted to, why must we delete them? Because they are being, artificially introduced going forward, right? Those things are not, those, those values are not being influenced by the previous layer. You just stuck zeros over there when you were going forwards. Right, but they, when we are doing back -up, so basically, they are not influenced. The derivative is zero, period. Yeah, so I'm saying they, they will automatically get ignored because the derivative is zero, right? That's, you, there's no automatically. When you get it, you're going to get a larger map. You're going to have to throw away the regions that you didn't cons that you didn't use going compute going forward. Otherwise, when you keep going backwards, the maps will keep increasing, and the derivatives that you get for the input is are going to be much larger than the size of the input itself. Yeah. Okay, guys, we've run out of time. Let me go out, go forward, go ahead, right? So we have 
to compute the derivatives with respect to the mth channel of the lth layer, we must select the mth channels of all of the filters, right? And these must be flipped left and right, top, top to bottom, and then they convolve with the zero padded derivative maps of the L, L plus one layer. And if the forward convolution has tried S, the derivative maps must be upsampled by S prior to convolution. So we've seen this. I have a, is there a question? So I have some uh, notes here and some pseudocode, but I'll skip that, right? We are still left with this business of computing the derivatives for the filters. We just figured out how to compute derivatives for y. How do I compute the derivatives for the filters? So let's take a look at that. Now, once again, uh, this animation is horrible. This is, thank you, MATLAB. The colors keep flashing. But then, the point of this was that each filter position influences every position in y, correct? So you can see that as the filter goes forward, the filter keeps getting used for every single, for every single position in z. So clearly, when I'm computing my derivatives for any particular component of the filter, all of these guys will contribute. But then, if I'm, con if I'm computing the derivative for the mth channel of the nth filter, then only the nth channel of the activation maps are going to contribute because that, pan cha that channel of the filter did not contribute to the computation of anything else, right? So let's see how this works. Now, in order to compute this affine map once again, at any location, actually let me just write this down, let's consider, say, the uh, 0, 1, 0, 2 position of the filter, right? The 0, 2 position of the filter uh, multiplies, sorry, this is the 1, 2. Actually, this is the 1, 2 position of the filter, right? The 1, 2 position of the filter multiplies y, 1, 2 to give you z, 0, 0. Right? When I skip forward, the 1, 2 position of the filter multiplies y, 2, 2 to give you z, 1, 0. This is the same math as before. As you keep working down, what you will observe is that at each position, the y, 1, 2 position of the filter is going to be, multi is going to be multiplying x plus 1, y plus 2 to give you the x, y position of z. Once again, this is the same arithmetic as before, right? the index of the filter and the index of z sum up to give you the index of y. So we haven't changed anything, right? And so I can write my equations down. I can say the the derivative of the loss with respect to say the mth channel of the nth filter, say xy, is going to be, what am I going to be summing over? So it's, it's going to be summing over all elements of the y, right? And this is going to be the derivative of the, or z actually, of the loss with respect to which one? I'm not, I'm not giving you the, uh, the layer number for now. Okay, this is going to be the derivative of which map? Over here. This is going to be the nth filter, the nth channel, right? So this is going to be over the nth channel only, right? And x prime, y prime times the derivative of z and x prime, y prime divided over with respect to w, m, n, x, y. Because you're summing over all of the output guys, right? And the term we really want is this term. And from this equation here, what can you tell me about the derivative of z, x, y with respect to w, x prime, y prime? Or flip it around, right? What is it gonna be? That's just going to be the y value, right? And that's going to be y of, this is the mth channel, this is the mth guy, x plus x prime, y plus y prime, correct? That's what this term is going to be. We just got that from the, uh, 
from the equations that we just saw. And so, in general, zxy is going to be, you know, the, the contribution is, is, is going to be a plus equals. These are not equals, right? Wij times y x plus i, y plus j. So, the derivative of zxy with respect to wij, now the derivative of znxy, which is to say the nth xy position of the nth output channel with respect to the filter that connects the nth output channel to the mth, the ijth position of the filter that connects the nth output channel to the mth input channel is simply going to be the x plus i, y plus jth position of the mth input channel, right? And I can just plug that into my equation right here. We already have the derivative of divergence with respect to z. This term, we just plug it in here, and then we get a formula, right? So, as always, this formula looks more complicated than it should be. So, what, what does this look like? This is a convolution also, right? Does everybody see this as a convolution? What kind of convolution is it? What is being convolved with what? Can you tell me? Pardon me? What is it convolving? It's convolving y, right? Let's see this visually, right? This is the, de the derivative of the divergence with respect to any particular element of any particular channel of any particular filter. There's an ugly looking equation where you sum over all the elements of the output channel, uh, the product of some, some crazy terms. Now, this is just a convolution, and let's see how it is, right? So here are all the input channels, and these input channels are being convolved with all of these filters to produce these output channels. Now if I consider any particular input channel and the corresponding output channel, this input channel is only convolving the corresponding ch channel of, of a specific filter to when it's computing a particular output channel. So if I'm looking at how the second input channel contributes to the first output channel, the activations wise, the, in the, the affine map for the first output channel, the uh, second input channel is convolving with the second plane, the second channel of the first filter to compute the first output affine map. This clear to everybody, right, visually? Nothing fancy, right? So I want to get, I already have the derivatives with respect to all of these guys. I want to get the derivative with respect to the elements of this term here. So guess what I'm going to do? I only need to consider these two guys. The rest of them are irrelevant, right? I'm going to convolve this input map with this derivative map, no flipping, nothing. I'm just going to, because the equation had a plus over here, plus x prime, plus y prime, so there's no flipping, right? All I do is I stick this, this, this orange guy here is the map of derivatives with respect to all the elements of the z, okay? I stick that in on the top left position of the corresponding input map, the input channel, and the inner product is going to give me the derivative with respect to the top left corner of the filter, that particular plane of that filter. And now I can keep sliding this forward, and I'm going to get the derivatives with respect to every element of the filter, of, of that channel of the filter. Is that clear to everybody? Right? It's, Visually, it's very clear when we do this. But then a filter just doesn't just have one channel. It has many channels, right? So if you want to get derivatives for all of the channels of the first filter, then you take the map of derivatives for the first output channel, convolve it with all of the input channels, and you're going to get the derivatives with respect to all of the channels of the first filter. Again, is this visually and mathematically clear to everybody? 
The math is obvious, but the visual interpretation is much cleaner, right? It just makes sense. And so this is the basic operation. Now, what if you are zero padding? In the forward, you would have to zero pad during computing the derivatives as well, right? What if you're striding going forward? You have to up sample to get the derivatives for the z, right? Because when you were striding going forward, you took these guys, you took the z's, and then you tossed out every second element or something. So you'd have to scale it up to the full size by, by up sampling, by introducing zeros, going backwards to do the same operation. So you, you up sample the derivative map for z and then convolve. Right? You're just going to undo all of the operations that you do, did going forward. And so I think there's one final poll. We have in time. Was it a repeat question? Okay. Good for you, right? We got the free. No, no it was not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's similar because the operations for, I'll, I'll stop here. I mean, most of you have answered. If you haven't, you can now, right? Yeah. But when you're speaking of the derivatives for the filters, not the input channels. Yeah, but it's the, same kind of style. the same style. It's not the same question. You fooled me and I revealed the answers, right? <laughs> So thank her. <laughs> so the derivative for the nth plane of the nth filter is computed by convolving the nth input layer map with the nth output layer derivative map, the affine derivative map, the z's, right? And furthermore, if the forward convolution has a stride s, the derivative maps must be upsampled by s to compute the obtain the derivatives for the input maps. And uh, uh, to, to obtain the derivatives for the filter. If you, have, if you perform zero padding going forward, you must zero pad going backwards as well. Okay, any questions? So again, uh, I'm gonna take a couple of minutes and say, we did a lot of work writing, showing you how the math worked. But if you have written your code, you didn't have to go through any of this. If you've written your code, the code is trivially fixed. So let's start with y equals ax, right? If I have something of this kind, ax plus b, it doesn't matter. Suppose I have dl over dy. What is dl over da? What's it? It's going to be dl over dy times x, right? In fact, if y is being used in many places, the thing you want to write is plus equal to, because, it, because uh, x might be contributing to other variables as well, right? Similarly, dl over dx is going to be dl over dy times a. This is a very trivial thing. There's, there's nothing magical over here. This is a, uh, the first, first lesson that you learn with derivatives, right? That's what we're gonna do, right? Think of what you do when, I'm, when you're going forward. Uh, this is, okay, this was the actual arithmetic pseudocode for the convolution for the filters. But let's, uh, so we've seen how to compute the derivatives for both the y minus one and the w's, but let's look at it through the lens of code, right? When you're looking at it through the lens of code, you're going through the layers, you're scanning forwards, right, across x and y, then when you're scanning, you're going, for, you're, you're going over all of the output channels. At each of the output channels, at each position, you're scanning over the area of the filter. And when you're going over the area of the filter, you're just doing z plus equals w times y. Right? This is just your standard forward computation. And then eventually, you're applying an activation on y. 
If I've written this code, I'm just going to use this little rule over here, okay? I'm going to rewrite this code with the indices going backwards. In this case, it can even go forward, okay? All I did was, uh, I'm going to assume that the derivative with respect to y is already ob obtained because I've been going forward, right? So the derivative with respect to z is simply dy times f prime. And this is essentially the same code, but because the derivative with respect to z is already given to me, I can just say dy plus equals w times dz, dw equals plus equals dz times y, right? This is way simpler than spending 90 minutes going through pictures. So if I just thrown this at you in the first five minutes of class, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay, it makes the same amount of sense, right? From the <laughs> but this is easier. I mean, you could have saved yourself the 90 minutes, but I'm gonna stop. So here's the complete, so, you know, without pooling, you're gonna do this, this backward. And now here's the beauty of it, right? If you had strides going forward, then the same mechanism still holds because all you do is unwinding the operations. So this is on the slides, take a look. I'll stop right here. We'll figure, we'll go through the rest of the uh, backward propagation in the next lecture. Thank you.